we all know that the level of poverty in the country has further risen in the past a few, few years. No? And we are again no, by the many challenges that we need to face. No? In the past months, we have been alarmed by virus crises, including ones related to learning, to health, to employment, and to climate change and the environment. Clearly, the Philippines has a long way to go if it is just estimated only to meet one SDG. The economic, social, financing, and institutional challenges are significant and needs our collective effort in order to meet them. This afternoon, we are fortunate to listen to a couple of presentations that will detail these global and Philippine challenges. The first is a presentation on updates on the Philippine progress vis-a-vis -vis the social, the sustainable development goals, which will be delivered by Mr. Guillaume Lafortune, the Vice President and Head of Paris Office of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and the lead author of the 2022 Sustainable Development Report, the, or SDR. The SDR was cited in nearly half of the voluntary national reviews that were reported at the UN High-Level Political Forum in 2021. And the European Parliament has recognized it as one of the 10 composite indicators that are helpful in creating policy. The second presentation will be from the Policy and Planning Group under Secretary Rosemary Edelion of the National Economic and Development Authority. Uh, who will respond to the presentation and provide broad ideas on how the new administration intends to meet the 2030 global goals. Dr. Edelion currently co-chairs the subcommittee on the SDGs of the Development Budget uh, Coordinating Committee, which is the current institutional mechanism that provides advice on policy integration, resource allocation, SDG-related reports such as the voluntary national reviews, monitoring of programs for the SDGs and undertaking stakeholder engagements. This forum is being organized as part of the General Assembly of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Philippines, which is composed of 23 private and public universities, research organizations, civil society groups, business networks hosted by the Ateneo de Manila University Institute of Sustainability. The network decided to open the discussion so that you, our partners and stakeholders in sustainability, can be better appraised of the need to better focus on development concerns at this half time. We hope that this forum will be enlightening to all, us, all of us and that we can collectively work in achieving our aspirational sustainable goals. Maraming salamat at magandang hapon sa lahat. Thank you, Dr. Toanyo, for your opening remarks. And uh, we echo Dr. Tuanyo's, uh, uh, Dr. Tuanyo's message that we are partners and, and stakeholders in sustainability, that we are all stakeholders in sustainability. While this is part of the General Assembly of SDSN Philippines, next slide, please. We are happy to have here members of our global community. We have members, uh, we have participants from, uh, from SDSN networks abroad, uh, country networks and regional networks abroad and some of them are saying hi in our in the chat section okay this uh good afternoon again everyone welcome to the plenary organized by sdsn philippines and the ateneo institute of sustainability i am emmanuel delocado the program manager for sdgs for sustainable development goals at the ateneo institute of sustainability next slide please the ateneo Institute of Sustainability was established in 2013 as a hub of the university's environment development agenda under the then President Father Jose Ramon T. Villarín, who is part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize some years ago. Our mission at the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability is to promote integral ecology and a culture of sustainability and resilience across the university and its partners. The Ateneo Institute of Sustainability houses three programs, namely Campus Sustainability, Climate and Disaster Resilience, and Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide. My program, the SDG program, has a tagline, Formation, Training, Solution. The SDG program at the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability, or AAS, provides an avenue for Ateneo de Manila University to provide relevant and appropriate information on sustainable development goals and integral ecology. We intend to provide such information to the stakeholders in the university and other major networks of universities and schools. 
Essentially, the SDGs program aims to mainstream the SDGs. And next slide. As we hopefully know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or the 2030 Agenda is a set of 17 goals launched in 2015 and aimed to be met by 2030. In the UN General Assembly, the SDGs were declared to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all people and the world by 2030. The SDGs were adopted unanimously by 193 countries in September 2015, including the Philippines. And it provides an arguably ambitious and measurable benchmark to end extreme poverty and reduce hunger, promote economic prosperity, deepen social inclusion, and strengthen environmental sustainability in the world. Next slide. AAS, through the SDGs program, houses the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Philippines. SDSN supports its member institutions around the world to play a leading role in sustainable development as research centers, as key partners in problem solving alongside government, business, and civil society, as educators, and as social entrepreneurs. As mentioned by Dr. Toanyo, currently, we have 23 member higher education institutions and research centers. And we have representatives from business sector and the industry in our leadership council. We are hoping to expand the network by having more members who have sustainable solutions to our national and local problems. Next slide. This plenary is part of the general assembly that we're having today. Earlier, we had a business meeting with our members to recap what has happened in the past year and determine the direction moving forward. And next slide. This plenary entitled Crossroad to 20, is entitled Crossroad to 2030 because we believe we stand at a crossroad. First, in a few months' time, we will be at the midpoint of 2015 to 2030. Later, we will hear where the Philippines and the global community stand in achieving the 2030 goals. We are facing some serious economic recession and an ecosystem collapse in different parts of the world. So how do these affect our targets or our, our direction in achieving the target? Second, we are standing arguably and hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic. In the In the Philippines, um, yes, in the Philippines, schools have been resuming face-to-face -face classes and tourism spots, businesses, you name it, have been returning to normal operations. However, while this seems hopeful, the pandemic hit many sectors badly. Many sectors are still in the process of recovery. And lastly, a few months ago, the Philippines ushered in a new administration. All eyes are on what the government, especially the president, will do in the first 100 days. Will the administration follow the course of the previous ones or will steer us elsewhere is something that we will see. Later, we will hear how the current administration intends to face these crossroads we are facing in light of the sustainable development goals. And next slide. And thus, SDSN Philippines and AAS decided to organize this public plenary entitled Crossroad to 2030, reviewing and recalibrating the SDGs roadmap of the Philippines. I am sure we will have a bountiful afternoon ahead of us, and so let us not wait any further. I would like to present our speaker for this plenary. Mr. Guillaume Lafortune is Vice President and Head of Paris Office at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN. He joined SDSN in 2017 to coordinate the production of the annual Sustainable Development Report, which includes the SDG Index and Dashboard, together with other projects on SDG data, policies, and financing. Previously, he served as an economist at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development working on public governance, reforms, and statistics. He was one of the lead advisors for the 2015 and 2017 Financial Statistical Report, Government at a Glance. He also contributed 
to analytical work related to public sector efficiency, open government data, and citizen satisfaction with public services. Earlier, Guillaume worked as an economist at the Ministry of Economic Development in the government of Quebec in Canada. September is obviously a very busy month for SDSN, but we are very pleased uh, for his uh, prompt acceptance of our invitation. I present to you, and let's please give him, let's please welcome him with a warm round of virtual applause, Mr. Guillaume Lafut. Guillaume, the floor is Thank yours. you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel, for the kind introduction and also for organizing this important uh, event today. Thank you also, uh, Dr. Tuanio, for your leadership for so many years now at SDSN uh, Philippines, um, and also to the Ateneo uh, School of, uh, of Government uh, as well. And also congratulations. I mean, it was very impressive to see uh, all the various uh, pieces of work and initiatives by, that are being led by SDSN uh, Philippines. So, so congratulations. And and very pleased to share also this uh, this panel, this discussion with uh, with Mrs. Uh, Rosemary uh, Edillon as, as well. Um, so as you as you mentioned, um, Emmanuel, I'm the I'm the vice president of DSDSN. I'm, I'm leading the work here at the Paris office, including our work related to SDG data monitoring uh, policies and, and financing uh, as well. So I think what I'll try to do uh, today, and I think I've been given about 40, 45 minutes, I'll, I'll start with sort of an overview of globally speaking, where are we standing when it comes to this uh, agenda? Uh, it's been mentioned previously, we're pretty much at halfway into the, the SDGs um, with a specific focus on um, the performance of the Philippines in our latest sustainable development report. And then I think I'll move on to, to share a few, a few thoughts um, around how can we uh, restore, accelerate SDG progress in the midst of multiple crises, health, um, security crises, climate crises, um, budget crises, um, and, and so on. Um, so I don't think I need to say too much about the SDSN, but you know, obviously just to say that we're a global network of researchers and scientists that are mobilized um, for uh, finding solutions to, to sustainable development. And we operate under the auspices of the UN Secretary General and under the leadership of Professor Jeffrey uh, Sachs. Um, so maybe we can move to the, to the next slide. And so a lot of what I'll be talking about is, you know, comes from a series of you know, flagships assessment and, and reports, obviously, you know, at the SDSN, the Secretariat and the networks, we do a lot of work uh, related to, um, to, to, to data and, and statistics. We, we do long-term pathways for sustainable development. We, we help countries also build up strong data systems for the SDGs, but we also do this flagship assessment, which is this SDG index and dashboards, which we've been producing since 2016 now, which sort of takes around a hundred, um, indicators um, and we cluster them across the 17 um, SDGs and look at um, how you know the distance of countries to achieving those those goals but also you know whether over time looking at the past growth rates over the past couple of years and when we extrapolate to 2030 whether countries are on track or off track for achieving um, the goals so you know, this is really the one of the major flagships of the of the of the organization. Um, I won't say too much about the methods, the approach. Um, you know, a lot of this material is accessible online, but we have been peer reviewed by Cambridge University Press um, and by Nature um, by Nature Geoscience, and we have um, also been statistically audited. So we've taken all the steps to make sure that our methods, our approach, were were rigorous and um, let's say complied with um, the most, the highest standards when it comes to data quality and, and the methods. And I also want to mention that we, we, you know, obviously when we do this at the global level, there's a number of data uh, constraints. There are issues that we cannot capture very well with, with global data sets. Sometimes there can be also issues around timeliness um, of global data sets. And so for these reasons, we also do more regional uh, editions. Um, for specific continents, um, Europe, Africa. Uh, we work with the Arab uh, regions as well, where we can tap into a bit more of regional indicator sets, uh, but also where we can discuss um, policy uh, issues and implementation issues at the regional level a bit more in details. And finally, it's great to have one data point 
per country on all of those indicators. Um, having said that, there's also often um, territorial gaps within countries when it comes to SDG performance, right? Between Manila and the rest of the country, the situation might be very different, uh, whether it's about poverty or environmental indicators, pollution, and, and so on. So it's also worth it to, to document a little bit those, those gaps by applying those, those methods at the subnational level. Actually, this is something that a lot of governments have been um, doing themselves, um, but we also have a, a method um, to do this, and we've worked with a, a number of, of countries and governments, including um, recently with the, with Brazil, for instance, where we've met the performance of 700 municipalities in Brazil, but also we've done work with, with Europe, Bolivia, um, Malaysia as well, and a couple of other countries where we look inside the country, uh, where are the, the, the major gaps in in uh, performance. And I must say that this work really benefits from the inputs of all of our networks. Um, so that's also a value added as well, is that we can tap into data, insights, statistics produced by our network of researchers and universities. So about two thirds of the data and the statistics come from UN custodian agencies. So the World Bank, um, the IMF, WHO, UNESCO, and so on. But about a third comes from outside of official statistics. Um, from the research, from peer-reviewed papers, uh, from NGOs, and so on. And, and those are very helpful to complement, um, especially in areas where there's um, still important data gaps in official statistics um, internationally. I'll move to the next slide. Um, so it, it has been said by, by, by Dr. Tuanio just, just before, um, you know, what, what we've been saying and it has been the main message of the 2022 edition. It's been also the main message of the 2021 edition is that basically the COVID-19 um, pandemic um, is a major setback um, for the sustainable development goals, right? So when we look and, and we're able to calculate this even before the adoption of the SDGs on, on the various indicators. So since 2010, let's say to, to 2021, we see that overall there was progress happening until the year 2019. Right. And in fact, this was to some extent driven by relatively rapid progress actually in Southeast Asia, um, especially when it comes to the social economic goals, um, you know, poverty eradication, education, health outcomes, which was also a legacy from the, the, the Millennium Development Goals, the, the MDGs. And so we, we documented actually in previous reports that Southeast Asia was actually the region that was progressing fastest since the adoption of the SDGs, but even um, beforehand on, on sustainable um, development. You know, having said that, uh, it doesn't mean that we were on track to achieve the SDGs before COVID. It doesn't mean that um, all the goals were moving in the right um, direction. Um, we're speaking a lot those days around what's going on around, you know, the food supply chains and and hunger and so on. Actually, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, before the, the crisis in, in Russia and in Ukraine, um, SDG2, we were not on track to achieve um, SDG2 very, very clearly due to rising undernourishment, but also rising obesity rates in other parts of the world. Um, so it doesn't mean that, again, we were on track, that all the goals were going in the right direction, that all countries were moving in the right direction. But on average, you know, the world was progressing um, towards sustainable development. This is no longer the case, um, basically since the year um, 2020. Um, and actually there's been a slight decline uh, on the average SDG index in 2020 and also in 2021. Uh, and, you know, and this decline is actually probably underestimated because we're still waiting for a lot of the, the data uh, to, be, to be updated for the years 2020 and 2021, but, you know, to a large extent, this um, this stagnation or even decline is driven uh, by the rise in poverty rates, um, unemployment, poor health um, outcomes, mainly in uh, low income uh, and developing uh, countries. So if we can move to the next um, slide. Um, so what you have on the top left here is um, how the, the percentage of people living in extreme poverty, so with less than $1.90 a day, has uh, changed over the past couple of years. And you see here that the COVID-19 pandemic has basically stopped um, pretty much a decade of progress, especially in countries with high levels of extreme poverty rates. Um, it has basically stopped uh, progress and actually led to a sharp 
increase in 2020 and in, in a number of countries also in 2021 when it comes to, um, to extreme poverty. It's the case also in regions with lower poverty rates. This is the, the chart with, with the colors that you have here, including actually in East and South, um, in East and South, South Asia as well. Um, and you know, I've shown here poverty rates at 190, could have shown also at 320, we could also have uh, shown the unemployment rate uh, trends. They all look the same. Basically, there's a break uh, for 2020 and 2021, um, you know, a, a stop in, in the progress that, uh, that we were making on those issues. And this um, negative trends, let's say, have not been compensated by, um, let's say, structural improvements on other goals, um, including some of the climate and the, and the biodiversity goals. So what you have, the second chart here on the right shows that Yes, during major lockdowns, um, there's been reductions in um, CO2 emissions. So here you have the trends for, for China and the United States, for instance. Um, but those temporary gains, um, for now, we don't see signs of uh, actual structural um, trends over time. And in fact, um, by the end of the year 2020, uh, both the US and China had gone back to pre-pandemic uh, levels of, uh, of, of emissions. When we look at the, the, our latest uh, edition, we continue to see a decline in performance in many of the low income and developing countries. And this is to a large extent uh, due to a more limited uh, recovery, right? So there's, you know, if, if we want to simplify this, there's been a bit of a two pace recovery to this crisis between those countries that were able um, to finance emergency expenditure and recovery plans by tapping into markets, uh, fiscal deficit and, and debt. But, but many low income and developing countries do not have, either do not have any access at all to markets or have very limited access to markets due to um, very high interest rates um, borrowings. And so you see that, you know, that's the chart on the bottom left here. You see that this is the unemployment rate. Um, the, the, the darkest color is the, uh, is the latest value for 2021. You see that in high income countries, um, there's been a, a, a reduction between 2020 and 2021 in terms of the, the unemployment rate. But you see that in low income countries, it has actually continued to um, increase between 2020 and 2021, hence you know, worsening the situation on, on this SDG uh, indicators. And the chart on the right basically illustrates what I've been saying, which is that when you look at the the fiscal uh, balance, you see that high income countries have been able to, to tap a bit more and generate um, deficit to finance the emergency expenditure and recovery plans. This is less the case for, um, for uh, poorer um, countries. So there's, for us, this is really a big question, and I'll go back to this in a second, but the question of you know, the access to, to financing um, especially um, in countries that start with a relatively large large gap on the on the SDGs and with major challenges is really the the core um, question uh, those days because obviously the SDGs to a large extent are an investment agenda into the physical infrastructures uh, renewable energy uh, digital infrastructures also you know adapting infrastructure to the challenges of, of climate change but also investments into the, the human capital. Uh, needed to achieve those goals, health, education, and so on. Um, and so it would be dramatic, actually, for this agenda if the current you know, budget constraints um, uh, and, and, and financial uh, constraints lead to a major slash in investments into the, the human and, and physical um, capital needed to, to achieve those goals. Next, next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, for this reason, and, and you know, I think it's, it's, it's something that happens when you <laughs> when you face so many crises. But um, there's been a number of, of calls to um, you know rethink uh, the, the SDGs. Um, some calling for improving them or even getting rid um, of the the SDGs. And you know sometimes in in very well established journals, um, you see here an editorial in, in Nature. There's also been pieces by the financial. Um, community and you know and at the same time what I've put here on the right side is just how relevant this agenda remains um, in, in current days so you have here a picture of 
you know, the, what happened in Sri Lanka not, not long ago, uh, where, you know, budget constraints com combined with, with inflation and issues around, you know, rising poverty, um, hunger, uh, worsening of the economic situation and, and you know, unstable um, public institutions can lead to major um, social crises, which are all things that the SDGs aim to, to address, right? And here at the bottom, and, you know, there could have been many, many more images, but, uh, but, but here you see, you know, um, yeah, the, the, the situation of glaciers in, in Europe um, collapsing, and you also had all the, the wildfires in many parts of the world, which is also things that the SDGs aim to, to address. So there's just, uh, you know, a little bit of a, uh, you know, it's, it, this agenda remains very much relevant to tackle uh, the challenges of our time. And, you know, it, it's useful always to remember that, you know, having this global agenda and having 193 UN member states um, uh, signing up on this agenda was a major accomplishment in, 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 20, uh, in 2015. And, you know, it's, it would be a pity if we lose um, if we lose sight and if we, we we stop considering that this should be our north um, star for you know public policies and, and cooperation. I also think it's it's probably not the right time to open up this discussion around revising those goals, considering especially how fragmented uh, multilateralism here is at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure actually that if we were trying today to come up with a global agenda. Um, and you know, bringing all the countries in the world to the table, we would actually come up with an agreement on a on a global agenda. And as I said, I think those seventeen goals are essentially seventeen systemic um, risks. So it's a little bit difficult for me to see what would you drop um, in this in this uh, agenda. So I think the point here is that the rationale behind the SDGs remains um, more relevant the, than ever. I think eventually in the mid twenty twenties there will be you know, an emerging debate around what comes next beyond 2030, but we still have, you know, a number of years to make major breakthroughs on the goals, but also on making sure that we have the right long-term plans, um, investment frameworks, and cooperation systems so that we can achieve, you know, major breakthroughs by 2030 and, um, and beyond. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I think it's it's important for the overall community to remain very very active um, and vocal around um, the the relevance and usefulness of those goals, especially in a context where there will be a heads of state summit happening in September um, 2023 at the UN. Um, this will be the second time since the adoption of the SDGs that heads of state will meet to discuss major priorities on this uh, on this agenda. The last time was in 2019 and. Obviously, I think we will all agree here that the world has changed a little bit uh, since 20, 2019. So we, you know, we, we think this this meeting should be, you know, an important moment um, to identify priorities, and especially when it comes to um, putting together a global plan to finance this agenda in the in the coming years. Um, let's move on to the next um, the next slide, and I think what we've been highlighting also over the years, and I'll move to the performance of the Philippines in a second, but is in particular the, the role of um, rich countries um, on, this, on this agenda. Um, so what you, what you have here is a comparison between um, the overall performance by, by regions um, on the SDG index, uh, that's on the left-hand side, versus um, the international spillover index, which is how much damages and impacts are being generated by the consumption, basically, of, uh, of major regions and countries. And we see here that, yes, European, uh, the European Union or OECD member states tend to outperform other regions, largely due to good uh, performance on the social economic goals, SDG 1 to 10. But they also generate massive negative impacts on the rest um, of the world by exporting um, uh, toxic pesticides, waste, but also through their own um, consumption, essentially. So that's the whole question around how do we clean up also supply supply chains and the role of, of rich countries to, um, to advance on this agenda at the, at the, at the global um, level. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the actual overall uh, ranking this year, so the Philippines rank um, 95 out of 163. 
um, countries, just to say that if I, I just looked beforehand and it's not you know fully comparable because we do some adjustments um, on the indicator side, but in 2019, for instance, the Philippines was ranked 97. So um, on, on our latest uh, ranking, it shows a, a bit of an improvement. And you also see here a bit of a, a comparison um, against um, the countries in the in the ASEAN uh, region. So the performance of the, the Philippines is you know, relatively close to, to what we see in, 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 Brunei, in Brunei, a little bit you know, behind Indonesia, um, but better than in um, Leopidiar, Cambodia, or, or uh, Myanmar, um, for instance. And at the top of the ranking are um, basically European um, countries, and in particular, Nordic um, countries. Again, this is to a large extent due to great performance on social economic uh, goals, but also SDG. Uh, 16 on public institutions, um, those countries still face, all countries actually face major challenge in achieving one or two um, SDGs. And this is the case also of, uh, of those countries. They don't have a perfect score. And um, even those Nordic countries perform relatively poorly on SDG 12 to 15 related to responsible consumption, production, climate action, and, and uh, biodiversity. Next slide, please. When it comes to the actual um, performance of the of the Philippines and the and the country profile, um, we see here that um, uh, compared to the average uh, performance in the region, the Philippines is slightly above um, the performance of East and South um, Asia. It's it's, it's uh, very slightly uh, uh, above the the, the average. Um, and we see here that you know there are obviously you know important challenges across all of the goals, but. Overall, when we look especially at the trends over time, we see that there, there is actually some progress. And this is, um, this is not from one year to another. This is looking at structural trends, basically, since the adoption of DSDGs, right? So we tried to have a baseline of 2015 or 2016 and look at the latest value, right? Are we making progress or are we moving in the, in the wrong direction? And you know, to, 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 to a large extent, there's been, uh, there's been progress on um, the majority uh, of the goals, actually, and including some of the goals which were starting from a ver very a relatively low, um, a, a ver relatively low performance. Something that's interesting also to note is that, um, you know, even in terms of, because what we try to do in those reports is obviously to identify, you know, policy uh, challenges. But also to look at on the data side, are there still challenges in terms of you know data availability, timeliness, accessibility, and so on? And you know, actually, Philippines is among the countries that has relatively low missing data in our SDG index. And also, according to the World Bank, um, there's been um, quite significant progress in recent years in terms of the statistical performance index as well. So the ability also of, of the Philippines to provide. Um, data and information uh, that can then be used for informing policies has actually increased, which is obviously very important um, in order to uh, to have evidence-based uh, policy making for the for the SDGs. Um, the next slide moves into a bit more of um, you know specific uh, indicators. You know where we've observed some positive developments, where you know some challenges remain. So we see here, for instance, and you know I think. Um, the Philippines long-term vision, the Ambition uh, 192040, um, calls for making sure that no Filipino should be poor or hungry. I think this is a major priority of the country. And we see here that um, there has been actually um, major progress on those two indicators, uh, uh, in fact. So you see it here on the poverty headcount ratio. We're not at, you know, zero. We, we, you know, the, 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 there's still room for improvement, but we see that the, you know, the improvements are very striking in the Philippines uh, on poverty at 190. Basically, it was at, at about 14% back in 2010, and now um, we're basically at around 4%. So it's a major drop. The same for the prevalence of undernourishment, which was close to 20%, and it's basically, basically been um, cut by half um, right now, uh, around 10%. So um, this is really, you know, significant progress have been achieved here, and the same for some education and health outcomes. You see it here on the participation rate of in pre-primary organized um, learning, which has also sharply improved in recent years. Um, I was actually it was interesting to see in the in the introductory video that the first couple of images were really about education, which is obviously absolutely key for achieving all of those goals. And we see we see here that. 
um, the access to pre-primary uh, education has increased a lot. And the same for mortality rate uh, under five, where there's been also significant progress on the, the health side, which is also, you know, as I said, probably a, a legacy also from the Millennium um, Development Goals. So, you know, a lot of improvements on the socioeconomic um, side. Um, a number of challenges um, also, um, which is not unique to the Philippines, uh, obviously, which actually applies to most countries in the region. And I would say actually most countries um, around the world, but you know, the questions of um, renewable um, energy and clean uh, electricity. So you see here that the CO2 emissions from fuel um, combustion per total electricity output is not, um, we don't see a, you know, a major um, structural change um, moving towards the, the, the target. Um, there's also a couple of health um, issues that, that, that remain that are specific to the, to the region and, and the Philippines. So we see here that the incidence, for instance, of tuberculosis remains relatively high, let's say, compared to what we see in other OECD countries, for instance, and we don't see in, in recent years significant um, progress uh, here. Um, and then there's some challenges related to, let's say, um, inclusive, um, effective um, uh, institutions. Um, we include the, the corruption perception index, for instance, here, but also um, there's been progress on, on uh, the participation of women in, in parliament, for instance, but we're still far from reaching uh, parity um, according to, uh, to the latest, uh, to the latest uh, statistics uh, available. Um, actually, it's, it's from 2020, so you know, things might have evolved considering that you had you know, a number of elections also uh, recently. But um, you know, those are some of the, the challenges that we can identify in the, in the, in the report. Next slide, please. So I think I've, I've, I've mentioned it um, earlier. There's the question of you know, how are we progressing towards achieving the goals, but obviously there are um, you know, data gaps um, when we do this. Um, usually when we look at this, it's actually the situation of as of one year, two years, three years ago. Um, and increasingly it's important also um, to track not only the outcomes, but also the policy efforts and the, the commitments that governments are making, which may put a country on track or off track towards achieving um, sustainable development in three, five, or 10 years, right? So this is a bit more forward um, uh, looking. And um, for that, we use um, a framework, which is um, the six SDG transformations framework, which was published in, in Nature in 2019 where we try to assess um, the efforts that are being made by, by governments around the world um, for major transformations, which should lead to the achievement of all of those goals. Those include um, transformation one on education, gender and inequality, um, two on health, well-being and demography, three on energy decarbonization and sustainable industry. The fourth one is on sustainable food, land, water and oceans. The fifth one is on sustainable cities and communities. And the sixth one is on the digital harnessing, the digital revolution for sustainable development. And all those transformations um, should be underpinned by two major principles of leave no one behind and circularity and um, decoupling. And you know, this framework was established so that you know, there's 17 goals. Obviously, you don't need 17 strategies to implement this agenda because there's um, synergies um, around those goals. And so it, it aims to be a bit more of an operational framework for governments, but also um, uh, invest, investors to think about you know, what, um, how to move forward on all of those goals at the same time in a, in a more, operational, um, uh, more operational way. So um, building on this framework, what we're trying to do is to look at you know, what are the progress in terms of policies, strategies, investments uh, around those six transformations. And we also gauge through a survey that we do every year um, let's say the focus of governments on the SDGs, right? Are there national indicator sets for the SDGs? Um, are the SDGs integrated into the budget? Um, are there speeches from the highest level of government in support of the SDGs and so on? So every year we try to complement, you know, the SDG index uh, with also a more timely assessment of the government um, strategies and efforts um, to implement this, uh, this agenda. Next slide, please. And so, um, you know, those are for the six transformation, the type of metrics that we're using. And here we 
We have this for all countries around the world, but here just for sake of presentation, it's focusing on, on G20 um, uh, countries and then averaging across regions. But we look, for instance, in the law, how many years of free education uh, is included, how many years of uh, free and compulsory education, whether there's a World Bank indicator on um, the integration of gender equality in the law, um, what's the level of um, uh, R&D uh, expenditure as a share of, of GDP. Um, that's for the transformation one on, on, on education, gender and inequality. On transformation three, we look at, which is on energy decarbonization and sustainable industry on commitments that are made in terms of net zero um, commitments, but also looking at um, using the work of the climate action tracker, what is included into the nationally determined contributions of, of countries and whether those targets are ambitious enough and the means of, uh, of implementation ambitious enough. Are there unconditional fossil fuel subsidies, right? So these are different types of indicators. They, they're really looking at the inputs, the process that give us a sense that whether in the next couple of years, there will be significant progress. They're not looking at the amounts of CO2 emissions and the trends in there, but whether in the coming years we can expect you know, major breakthroughs and, and improvements um, on all of those six transformations. The next slide, please. And we complement this with sort of an overarching assessment of, you know, the overall efforts that we see of countries um, when it comes to, to this agenda. So, you know, I think halfway into the SDGs, countries that have never submitted a DNR, this is a, this is a, a quite a significant signal of um, how much countries are embracing basically this uh, this agenda, right? A country like the Philippines has submitted already three uh, DNRs, so it's actually you know it actually shows remarkable support for this agenda. I think it's in 2016, 2019, and actually in the latest 2022 HLPF, the Philippines submitted a, a, a DNR. A country like the United States is part of those six countries that has never submitted a voluntary national review, uh, for for instance. Um, so this is one of the other indicators that we use to gauge really the country's efforts, because we feel like when you do a VNR, at least you need to look internally. I mean, there's the output, there's the VNR report, but also the process is very important so that you know governments uh, think about uh, the implementation of the agenda, where are the gaps and the, the priorities to, to achieve the goal. So this is an, obviously a very important uh, process. Next slide, please. Um, and we also look at other, um, we also assess other, um, you know, sort of proxy measures of the integration of the SDGs into key policy um, processes, right? So we look at whether there's been high level statements by presidents, prime minister in support of this agenda over the past 12 months, whether we see evidence of integration of the SDGs in uh, sectoral strategies and action plan. Um, whether there's been integration of the SDGs in the latest budget document, whether there's a national indicator set for the SDGs and Last year, we also started looking at whether the SDGs were also part or a cornerstone, let's say, of COVID-19 recovery plans. And the overall message that's emerging here is that there's been, you know, relatively high support for the SDGs when it comes to, um, let's say, rhetoric, um, speeches, but also in, in action plans and so on. But when it comes to, let's say, harder, um, let's say, engagement with the SDGs, including when it comes to the, the, the budget, the, the annual budget, we see a little bit less integration or challenges, um, at least in countries for uh, making the connection between SDG performance and um, the budgeting. Next slide, please. And so using those various metrics, so we use the six transformation scorecards that I mentioned, but also those proxy measures around the integration of the SDGs, we we came up last year with an assessment of what's the level of um, engagement and efforts um, of, of uh, a, a bit more than 60 countries um, around the world. And again, this is also a lot of the data are building on our networks, which provide inputs and insights um, for this, but we also um, share those results for comments and, uh, and, um, and suggestions to, um, to the, 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 the UN uh, country missions in, in New York uh, as well. So there's, there's a consultation process and engagement process around those, those results to make sure that we have accurate and, and timely, uh, timely data. So when we look at the Philippines, um, so the first thing is that we see no country that really achieves the, the highest level, let's say, of, of commitment, which you know, we, we estimate at between 80 and, and, and 100. But there's a number of countries that are, you know, moderate or high um, SDG, uh, high SDG commitment. Then, you know, the Philippines, basically, we see it as comparable in terms of SDG engagement to 
um, to what is achieved in the region. It's actually at the high, um, on the high uh, spectrum when it comes to the engagement with this agenda, comparable with Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, but actually uh, you know, greater engagement than what we see, well, for instance, in, in, in China, but also in, in a country like Vietnam, um, for instance. Um, so we see relatively high um, uh, support and efforts uh, this agenda. It doesn't mean that there's no um, uh, challenges uh, here. And one thing that's important to note is that this represents obviously the efforts and commitments of the, the previous uh, government, because obviously you've had uh, elections not, uh, not long ago. But I think some of the, just to mention some of the, the aspects where you know, we see um, persisting gaps. So as many other countries, the integration between SDGs and, and, and budget could probably be um, uh, strengthened. R&D expenditures in the Philippines remain uh, relatively low compared to what we see in, in other countries, including in many OECD uh, countries. According to the World Bank, the integration of gender equality in the law could also be uh, strengthened, persisting issue around universal health um, coverage as well. And according to the net zero tracker, there's still no net um, zero target in the, in the Philippines, which is also sort of a sign, uh, a bold uh, commitment um, when it comes to the climate um, agenda. And so I think, and this will be, I think, my last slide for today. Um, but increasingly what we want to do, and that's the, the next slide, what, we, what we're trying to do is to have this sort of um, you know, comparison, basically. Um, this is the, yeah, exactly this one. Um, the comparison between what's the SDG gap and what is the government effort and commitment um, for, the, for the SDGs, right? And so the, the Y axis um, here is the actual gap. So how much countries need to travel to achieve the SDGs. And the X axis here shows how much we think the government is putting efforts, commitments, engagement for this agenda, which might suggest that actually, um, you know, it might achieve major breakthroughs in um, reducing the gap in the coming in the coming years. And this information, I think, is particularly interesting in the context of um, the impact um, investing discussions, but also in the context where there's a growing number of governments that are um, putting together some um, sustainability themed bond frameworks, including SDG bond, uh, for instance, to finance um, physical infrastructure and human capital needed to achieve the, the SDGs, um, because it gives a little bit of indication to impact investors around where they can have the most impact. That's the gap that needs to be filled, but also where there's a greater likelihood that um, there will be uh, the expected impact uh, with the money invested because the government is very serious around achieving um, sustainable, uh, sustainable development. And, just to give one example, we're working closely with a country like Benin uh, in Africa, for instance, that has issued the first African uh, SDG bond. And you see that Benin among our sample of countries is among the countries where the SDG gap is the largest, um, uh, basically, with a score just above 50. But when we look at the actual level of commitment and engagement of the government for this agenda, um, it's actually very, very high with, you know, a, a number of, of, of targets, a number of um, you know, really bold commitments, including in the in the law, uh, and also great integration of the SDGs into a number of policy processes and, and so on. Um, so that's for the main results, the global results, and um, and also the results for the Philippines and the latest SDR. And I think now I, we can stop the, the slide sharing. And just to to conclude uh, for for today, what I wanted to do is just to share a few a few a few thoughts um, on sort of the, the priorities for um, accelerating uh, restoring first accelerating SDG progress um, globally, um, and this is very much part of a new flagship um, project or initiative that we're that we will launch at the SDSN um, ahead of the Heads of State Summit in 2023, which is this new. SDG Transformation Center, which aims to you know, continue to provide key tools, instruments for SDG implementation, building on our global networks of scientists and experts, but making that extra step of bringing those tools and instruments like the SDG index, like our six transformations, other um, modeling work and roadmaps that, we are, that we're working on to um, the decision makers in the public and the private um, sector. So strengthening our interactions with governments, the multilateral system, but also 
the investment, uh, the investment community. So that SDG Transformation Center will be operational before the Heads of State Summit. I think there's five major, you know, um, key points that I'd like to emphasize um, ahead of that um, Heads of State Summit, but also uh, in general for if we want to have any chance of restoring accelerating SDG progress. The first one is related to the role of multilateralism and international um, cooperation. So, you know, you've seen it in the slide, um, pandemics, wars also, and we will see it in the, in the next sets of data, but also other major crises um, are generate major setbacks for the SDG. So those are obviously uh, preconditions um, for having any chance, you know, preserving peace uh, and, um, and preventing and responding adequately to major shocks are obviously uh, major preconditions for making progress on this agenda. And one thing that will be very important will be to learn the lessons from COVID-19 on some of the successes, but also the failures of multilateralism um, to respond to this crisis um, for the WHO, but also for uh, multilateralism as a whole. And I want to mention here that under the leadership of Professor Sachs, next week, actually on the 14th of September, um, will be we will have the launch of um, the uh, final report of the Lancet uh, Commission uh, on COVID-19, which is making key recommendations on how to strengthen multilateralism and international um, cooperation in the context of, uh, of pandemic prevention and response, but also broadening up the recommendations to cover also other uh, critical risks, including you know, what can we learn from COVID in order to tackle climate change, um, other health risks, um, cyber security risks, and, and so on. So this will be happening um, next week, and it will be basically around the same time as the, the UN General Assembly. The second point, so that was the first point on, on multilateralism, the importance of multilateralism and international cooperation. The second point is on financing the sustainable development goals, right? So, you know, peace, avoiding pandemics, preconditions, um, but if we want to have any chance of restoring accelerating SDG progress, there needs to be basically a global plan for financing um, this agenda, right? As I said, it would be um, really a, uh, a huge blow for this agenda if um, suddenly countries needed to contract significantly their investments into human and physical infrastructure needed to achieve um, those goals. And here, I think there's obviously various pieces to that, um, to that discussion, um, but really the point, and that was the first chapter of the Sustainable Development Report this year, was to call for a global plan um, for financing the SDGs. So there's the question around the credit ratings, right? Could we connect a little bit better the credit ratings, which then you know determine obviously the interest rates that governments are paying, so the cost of, of borrowing. Could we connect this a little bit better with the quality, the robustness of sustainable development plans, um, basically? The role of rich countries, right? We Obviously, we've missed the, the target when it comes to the the, the, the 100 billion uh, promise for, for climate finance and for uh, adaptation. Um, there's obviously a, a historical responsibility um, here, and I think this will be a major topic at the next COP um, in November. There's also important discussions happening on innovative financing instruments. Um, a question, obviously, discussions around the debt relief issue, but also the climate for debt um, swaps discussions. And, I mentioned it briefly, but also all the, the, the talks around the sustainability, sustainability themed bonds, right? The green, social, blue SDG bonds, um, but also those sustainability linked uh, bonds. We have seen in certain cases, and I, I mentioned that we've worked with, with Benin in the past, we've seen that those can be ways for government um, to actually borrow at lo lower rates. So to get greeniums uh, on, their, on, their, uh, on their interest rates to borrow for long maturity. So in the case of Benin, they, they borrowed for 12.5 uh, years and to actually mobilize significant resources for investing into sustainable um, development, which you know, might um, suggest that increasingly markets recognize that investing into sustainable development increases growth potential and hence the capacity of countries to, to reimburse. And I think I, I was just looking at the Philippines BNR before this meeting, and I think there's a sustainable finance um, roadmap and guiding principles, which, which covers also this issue around uh, whether blue bonds could help, basically could be directed towards um, the management of coastal and the, and the marine um, sector. So whether those could be instruments also to finance um, some of the, 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 the expenditures related to the protection of coastal and, and marine 
um, areas in the in the Philippines. Um, so for innovative financial instruments, obviously the role of the IMF, um, but also the role of the multilateral development banks um, that can you know borrow at lower rates um, and also basically coordinate projects at the at the regional level, uh, which often the SDGs call for you know, regional integrated energy grids, for instance. So it's not only national investments, but this question around regional investments um, is also is also important. And, and I think here multilateral development banks can play a key role. And then obviously the G20, um, the role of official development assistance. And beyond this, I think increasingly we also recognize the role of technical um, cooperation um, uh, in order to achieve, for instance, um, just uh, transitions, um, you know, as it was announced at the last COP between, for instance, the EU, the US, and a couple of other high income countries and South Africa um, to lead to a just uh, transition in, in South Africa. So that's the second point, the financing question. The third priority is really, and I've been insisting a lot on this today, but the country strategies and the, and the roadmaps, um, right? So for you know, resilience, uh, adaptation, um, uh, budget, and so on, um, you know, obviously it's important to have the right magnitude of financing, but it also needs to be uh, connected with sound strategies, roadmaps, plans, building in, um, in science um, and, and, and so on, um, so that we have a clear, um, a clear uh, direction um, in order to achieve uh, you know, major, major breakthroughs. And, and here as the SN and its networks are working closely with a number of, of countries, um, including in Africa, but also right now those days is with small island uh, developing states, uh, for instance, to see, to have this dual message on, we need to mobilize more financing, obviously, but it also needs to be a, uh, um, uh, combined with uh, sound and rigorous plans at the country level for uh, you know, adapting uh, infrastructure and, uh, uh, and, and resilience. The fourth point is the role of um, scientific net networks, innovation, and education for sustainable development. So at SDSN, we obviously coordinate major progress around uh, making monitoring and recommendations from the scientific community to preserve uh, global commons like the science. Uh, there's a project around the science panel for the Amazon, the Congo Basin um, as well, but also in general, the role that scientific networks can play in supporting um, uh, governments in terms of instruments, um, what are sound targets, country strategies, um, and the role of consultation, obviously, in the local level as well, um, which is absolutely crucial for implementing this, uh, this agenda. And I think COVID-19 has shown uh, that science can help identify solutions for the challenges of our times, including through the development, for instance, of the, of the vaccines. And obviously, I, I insisted also a lot on this, but the question of education, uh, where we've seen in the Philippines there's been major progress, um, is absolutely crucial. And you know, at SDSN, obviously, we have this SDG Academy, which aims to sort of broaden the access um, to education on, on sustainable development. And the fifth point and the final point is uh, the role of data and information uh, systems, alternative data sources, real-time data, um, but also the importance of being able to monitor uh, adequately business compliance uh, and actions throughout the entire supply chains. Um, we published a spillover index every year that looks at the impacts embodied into unsustainable supply chains um, and continue to use the SDGs really as a monitoring tool at the regional, at the national, regional, subnational level. And increasingly, the role also of um, geospatial data, GIS data and maps. Um, I think we cannot conceive right now a biodiversity strategies without really having extremely granular um, in a, uh, information on where are the, the, the hot uh, spots uh, and in order to, to inform those, um, those, those policies and investments. So there's going to be a couple of events coming up. Uh, I've been insisting a lot on the Heads of State Summit in September 2023, but I don't want also to overlook the other ones, um, including ONGA, which will start in a couple of days, the UN General Assembly, COP27 uh, in Egypt in November, um, and obviously COP15, um, uh, on biodiversity in, in Montreal um, later, uh, later this year. Um, it will be important to obviously strengthen the SDG narrative in the run up to those uh, events, really emphasize the role of the, the rich countries and key institutions to, uh, to address the SDG financing gap. Global pathways roadmaps show that it's possible to move from point A to, to point B on the SDGs. We're also trying to document where are the best practices, the champions that we've seen also over the past couple of years, considering how difficult the situation is, 
we hope to have also some some good um, examples of you know cities or initiatives that can also give a little bit of hope uh, in the run up to the 2023 heads of state summit. And I think here our networks are also well positioned also to document some of the things that have actually worked well since the adoption of the of the SDGs and a clear focus on uh, consumption and, and adaptation issue. And I'll finish with this, but just to see that to say that we're uh, very happy to explore uh, how to cooperate in the context of this SDG transformation center that we're setting up with the Philippine government, but also all uh, stakeholders uh, that are here uh, today, because we, we need, really need to put all of our energy together to restore and accelerate uh, SDG progress um, these days. So feel free to, to reach out, of course. I'll stop here. I hope, Emmanuel, I have uh, sort of uh, um, met my my time requirements but again a big thank you to you at SDSM Philippine and the whole team for organizing this event and uh, very much looking forward also to the, to the discussion thank you thank you thank you Guillaume for your presentation let's please uh, give him a round of virtual applause okay. yes uh, thank you for joining us this early morning from where you are now from uh, from Guillaume's presentation uh, we were able to uh, understand to hear that first globally there are some temporary gains in the SDGs in achieving the SDGs, but we have seen also a uh, decline in achieving the SDGs. No? Uh, Mr. Lafotsun uh, pointed out that especially under the influence of the pandemic, the issues of financing and investment to human capital is a major challenge, especially for low uh, income and developing countries. Uh, second, in the context of the Philippines, based on the recent SDR, the Philippines is slightly above compared to our neighbors in the region, very slightly above. Since 2015, there were some progress in particular goals, so some drop in other targets. However, the Philippines has moderate SDG commitment. Um, nonetheless, Mr. Lapatsun point, uh, punctuated the point that having the goals remains relevant and it should be and should remain to be our North Star in our social, economic, and environmental planning. He shared uh, the six transformations as a framework moving forward and ended this talk with some recommendations for the Philippines. We will have some time for questions, uh, uh, to ask him some of our questions later during the open forum. But at this point, we will proceed with a response from the Philippine government. Allow me to introduce our discuss discussant speaker to respond to the talk by Mr. Lapotun. Uh, USEC, Undersecretary Rosemary Edelion, is currently the Undersecretary for National Development Policy and Planning at the National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA. Yusek Edelion holds a PhD in economics from the Trobe University in Australia, an MA degree in economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics, and an MS degree in statistics from the UP School of Statistics. She's also a 2019 Presidential Gawad CES Award. Among her major responsibilities, on shepherding the formulation of the Philippine Development Plan, or PDP. The PDP is an elaboration of the country's priorities over the medium term and is the blueprint of government policies, programs, and projects. Currently, Yusek Anilion chairs the task group on recovery under the National Task Force Against COVID-19 and heads the Secretariat of the Economic Development Cluster of the Cabinet. Friends in sustainability, allow me. Uh, let's please welcome Yusek Rosemary Adelia. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, uh, good afternoon. And thank you very much for uh, uh, for, for inviting the NETA to this uh, to this uh, very, very important forum. Uh, good afternoon to uh, Dr. LaFortune, uh, Dr. Emmon, of course, and then Dr. Randy, and to um, our, our guests. I see that there are a lot of uh, state universities and colleges uh, represented here. So thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Um, I, I have a, a, a quick presentation. I hope quick. <laughs> if I may be allowed to share my screen, please. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, just to confirm that you're able to see my screen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Uh, 
uh, once again, thank you very much for this uh, for this opportunity. And uh, it was very interesting reading the uh, uh, sustainable development reports. So uh, I'll be uh, I'll begin my presentation with that. Some insights from the SDR and the uh, uh, what are our strategies in the SDG implementation and the uh, rallying actions to put the SDGs back on track. Actually, uh, as a spoiler alert, <laughs> I'd like to say that uh, our um, our uh, soon to be formulated Philippine development plan is all actually also um uh will be formulated around the uh, the, the theme of transformation you have heard this said by uh, by the uh, president during his uh, state of the nation address so um so it's really about uh, uh the sustainable the sustainable development report of uh, of 2020 where we have seen that uh, many of the countries, of course, including the Philippines, uh, suffered uh, setbacks and a reversal of uh, of the gains that we have achieved. We have achieved in the SDGs. So the question is, um, how do we recover, get back on track, and uh, hasten our SDG progress? So let me just uh, reiterate uh, those um, insights from the SDR 2022 which uh, actually calls for uh, six SDG transformations. Uh, first is on quality education. Two is on access to good quality and affordable health care. Three on renewable energy and the circular economy. Four, sustainable land and uh, marine management. And then sustainable urban infrastructure. And then six is universal access to digital services. And then, of course, supporting all this is a, is a, a, a plan or actually a global plan to finance the SDGs and, and that this is really needed. So in terms of uh, in terms of the global trends, so as I've said, uh, the pandemic and other crises have reversed the, the gains that we have achieved in the SDGs. Uh, and we have also reported this in the uh, in our latest uh, VNR. And uh, in the SDR 2022, it actually uh, reported on on two major uh, SDGs, SDG one and SDG eight, that have been uh, especially impacted. In the case of the Philippines, um, uh, we have we already know that the uh, uh, full year. Um, poverty incidents uh, among population and using our uh, our national poverty thresholds increased to an 18.1 percent from a 16.7 in 2018, and this translates to 2.3 million more Filipinos being pushed into poverty from 2018 to 2021. We are happy to note, however. Um, Although that that's a poor choice of words, I know. Um, but from 2015 to 2018, um, we the, the the country has uh, actually um, has actually seen six million uh, poor Filipinos graduate out of poverty. And then between 2018 to 2021, mostly because of the pandemic, we saw that 2.3 of them slid back into poverty. So for us, what that means is that you have, um, you know, about 4 million or close to 4 million uh, who were previously poor Filipinos that did not actually slide back into poverty, even with that global pandemic. Of course, uh, government was very, very, um, was very uh, intentional in terms of providing uh, assistance, uh, especially to the most uh, vulnerable. Let, but let me just proceed uh, as to our uh, strategies in SDG implementation. And uh, of course, it all points back to the ambition at in 2040, which was also mentioned by, uh, by uh, Dr. Guillaume, uh, Guillaume <laughs> earlier. Uh, that this is the life we want, that by 2040, the Philippines will be a prosperous and predominantly middle-class society. At the very least, no one is poor. No one is hungry. Our people will live long and healthy lives, be smart and innovative, and live in a high-trust society. So the very reason why we actually co committed to the uh, sustainable development goals is because we know that if we're able to achieve the SDGs by 2030, then that increases our likelihood of achieving for all Filipinos this aspiration uh, for, for 2014. So 
even even before this SDR 2022, uh, as you know, the uh, SDG, the agenda is actually a very complicated agenda. But when we go to the uh, to to the the, the regions, the subnational uh, government, we just mentioned the two basic principles of SDG, and I think this one uh, largely reflects the uh, the principles uh, that were that are also expounded in the SDR 2022. That we just mentioned that it's about two things. It's about sustainable development. So in the SDR, it's about um, the circular economy, and then no one left behind. So it's really about making sure that uh, the, the, the development tracks actually across uh, the economy, society, and an environment um, do, not, uh, do not really compromise uh, the development of the other uh, uh, as, uh, yeah, because we want to make sure that uh, we will still uh, live, um, you know, the, the next generation with a lot of resources so that they too can reach their full potential. Now, with respect to the first uh, transformation that was uh, mentioned in the SDR on, on quality education, so based on the report, uh, the Philippines is uh, moderately improving in its performance, uh, but there are challenges uh, that remain. And I'm sure it's been in the news uh, lately, and uh, even our legislators have, uh, have really uh, taken, uh, taken note of it. And there will now be an education uh, and, and, and com too. And uh, uh, and uh, among the um, action plans that uh, we will be proposing, or actually we have proposed to this Ed EDCOM2, are one, a review of the basic education curriculum. So we know that uh, we have actually um, increased the access to education, but this time we want it increase the access to quality education and also promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So we need a review of that basic education curriculum. We want, we need to rationalize the workload of teachers. This has been uh, uh, the result of various studies. We need to upskill the, uh, we need upskilling programs for teachers. We need also the expansion of coverage of uh, regional science high school so that we will have, uh, you know, many, many more children can have, um, access to uh, to quality science and in the stem education and then of course uh, uh, other uh, structural issues like uh, um, teacher to learner ratio etc next is uh, access to good quality and affordable health care uh, this is uh, this was really um, been revealed to us the weaknesses of our healthcare system uh, during the uh, during the pandemic, and so um, right now, uh, as I speak, we're actually developing a pandemic response playbook uh, together with the DOH and also the uh, UP National Institute for Health. Uh, we have already uh, we already have a draft, and it is now undergoing consultation. We just had our third consultation uh, yesterday, and we will have some regional consultations on that. Next is uh, formulating and implementing this health resiliency plan. Uh, actually, early on during the pandemic, we made use of the Agenda 2030 in order to identify the vulnerabilities of the Philippines with respect to this uh, COVID-19, which is actually a communicable disease. So we have made use of uh, you know this uh, uh, this framework, and that's why. Uh, yes, we do agree that uh, now is not the time to change this agenda. It's uh, it's proven very useful. Just have to know how to use it. So we uh, in in coming up with this health resiliency plan, we want a very holistic approach. We want to be very comprehensive and taking note that a number of the strategies that we need are actually outside of the health sector. So we we need to be very uh, uh, holistic about this one. On this uh, third transformation on the uh, energy and circular economy, again, uh, just to, to inform uh, the, the body here that uh, um, this has also been uh, included in the priority legislation, legislative priorities of the, of the president during the uh, State of the Nation address. Uh, it's really about uh, uh, legislation and natural gas uh, industry. Uh, we need to diversify uh, the country's primary sources of energy. We think that this is particularly important at this time and actually going forward uh, because we see that uh, there are a lot of market failures 
uh, around this uh, market on, on fossil fuels. And so we do need to reduce our dependence on uh, fossil fuel. So not just for, for the environment, but also because it's really affecting our ability to, uh, to, to improve the well-being of each and every one, not just the Filipinos. And so we are really uh, looking closely at uh, how, do we, um, how do we encourage the development of this reliable, sustainable, and modern energy. Next is on the issue of the uh, uh, um, taking urgent actions to combat climate change and its impact. We have actually uh, finished the uh, Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production. And we finished this back in uh, December of 2019. But of course, you know that uh, in 2020, uh, many, uh, all of these uh, initiatives had to take uh, the back burner because of the uh, COVID effort. But right now, we think it's time to uh, implement that Philippine Action Plan. This is actually a full set of, uh, of action, uh, what we call an action nodes, policy nodes, uh, for um, uh, R&D as well, infrastructure, and for IEC. It includes legislation that is needed, uh, improving our statistical uh, system for the, uh, uh, for the accounting of all this, uh, uh, you know, our footprint, uh, so that everyone will be aware uh, of uh, the footprint, not just the consumers, but also uh, not just the producers, but also the consumers. And like I said, it also contains a number of uh, proposed legislation, uh, which we have been uh, um, uh, actually uh, presenting to the legislature. Um, and uh, some of these are also included in the uh, legislative priorities of the president. Um, on this one, uh, I will not elaborate much. Uh, this is really on land and marine management, and we do have uh, also a number of action plans. Also, uh, uh, the action plan for uh, you know the blue economy, which is uh, very important, obviously, for the Philippines. Now, just to mention it as well that for um, on sustainable urban infrastructure, which covers the goals uh, six, uh, nine, and eleven. Uh, at the onset of the pandemic, the government shifted actually its infrastructure investment priorities to respond to uh, better to the new priorities, including on water supply uh, and sanitation, um, health infrastructure, and also upgrading and, and expanding our transport facilities to address uh, mobility uh, requirements under the new normal. And so uh, what we uh, again plan to do is to uh, look at uh, the uh, the lessons learned, take stock of all those lessons learned. And we want this to be, um, uh, we want the initiative uh, to be sustained and because we know that uh, it will, it's, it's gonna build our resilience going forward. And then the sixth one is on the universal access to digital services. Again, uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, this was in, in April, April of 2020, we uh, conducted a very massive uh, online survey just to find out how people are doing, how people are coping, uh, business sector, the consumer sector, uh, and also our agricultural sector, how they're coping with the, uh, with the lockdown restrictions. And uh, from there, we, we found out that only 12.4% per, of firms were able to transition to uh, a work from home arrangement. And so for us, this is also uh, reflective of the low level of digitalization of, of our industry sector. And so um, our proposed action plan is actually, um, you know, uh, government will, um, will, will begin uh, this uh, transformation with the e-government e act, the internet transaction act or the e-commerce law. During the pandemic, we have uh, made uh, significant strides in terms of uh, uh, being able to um, actually uh, ease those uh, policy and regulatory constraints uh, that uh, that hinder this uh, this uh, proliferate the, the access the co the broadening of the coverage of digital services. So, as you know, we have we have passed uh, major legislations regarding this one, uh, and also with respect to the regulations, uh, securing permits, uh, the uh, uh, shared tower facility. Uh, uh, at at the time, it was just an executive order, but anyway, going forward, 
this will also be a major uh, effort of, of government. And of course, it's really important that we rally actions to put the SDGs back on track. Um, actually, it was uh, in, in late uh, 2021 when uh, you know a reali reality check. We committed to uh, to a report during the 2022 VNR, and therefore we have to start the process of the uh, the VNR process in 2021. Uh, at the beginning, it was uh, it was difficult uh, trying to get uh, people to think about you know the future <laughs> because it seems that we were uh, we were confronted with an existential threat, which is the COVID-19. Uh, but what we did was to, um, uh, was to make use of uh, futures thinking, uh, foresight planning in order to, and again, making use of the, uh, the, the framework itself of the Agenda 2030 to make people realize that this remains very, very um, relevant to us even for this time. So, so right now we are uh, uh, we're coming up with the Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028, and this is now the framework for that uh, for that new PDP. So as I mentioned before, so for 2040 it's still the ambition at in 2040, but by 2028 we want to have that uh, we want to undergo we have to have we want to have that economic transformation for a prosperous inclusive and resilient society. Two prong, one is uh, developing and protecting the capabilities of individuals and families. And the next one is transforming production sectors so that they generate more quality jobs and competitive products. And of course, you still have those uh, enabling environment, which includes accelerating climate action and strengthening disaster resilience. Uh, I do not have the time to, uh, uh, to, to, to elaborate on this framework, but you are welcome to uh, uh, attend our consultation forum beginning on Friday this week. So um, just to show you as well that we have already um, identified the different SDGs, uh, the different targets actually of the SDGs that, uh, that could be, um, uh, that uh, actually fits well. With the uh, with the framework of of the PDP, and there are actually two companion documents of the uh, PDP. One is the results matrix, which is really just uh, a compilation of all the uh, uh, outcome indicators pertaining to each chapter of the PDP. And in this outcome indicators, we uh, first take a look of all at all these uh, uh, SDG indicators, so that. When we monitor the PDP, we are already monitoring the SDG. So, uh, oh, the other companion document is the uh, public uh, investment program. So, we have talked about, uh, you know, the, the next steps. It's really about yes, the financing plan and uh, effective resource mobilization. So. In the Philippines, we have also made use of uh, legislation in order se to secure financing for the SDGs. Actually, our um, our new syntax uh, syntax law th this was passed in 2019 mandates that 20 percent of that revenue goes into funding the SDG programs, and uh, we will be making use of program convergence budgeting framework beginning next year. Uh, and uh, this is actually what uh, what could galvanize, uh, you know, more uh, programs into the SDG. Again, to be fair, many of our regular programs are already meant to address the SDGs, but we're thinking we can make use of this uh, program convergence budgeting framework in order to reach the farthest behind. We also have uh, a robust monitoring system in place, so the Philippine Statistics is Statistics Authority, and then complemented also by the community-based monitoring system, which is being piloted still this year and next year, but by 2024, we will be having it on a regular basis. And then ownership of the SDGs at both the national, subnational, and the local levels. Uh, as mentioned, we do have the subcommittee on the sustainable development goals, and this sits actually as a, as a member of the uh, as a subcommittee of the DBCC, the Development Budget Coordination Committee. Uh, 
the uh, regional counterparts of this subcommittee is actually uh, part of the Regional Development Council. And then we have also institutionalized stakeholder engagement. We have, um, we have come up with uh, what we call the stakeholders chambers. It consists of uh, our uh, private sector and the civil society. And uh, we have actually, uh, uh, we have uh, began to map out all those uh, SDG related uh, um, efforts or initiatives of the members of the stakeholders chambers. And this is uh, actually being uh, updated. And what we want to happen is that uh, going forward, we will also be, uh, we also have a mapping of, uh, of the current uh, government uh, uh, initiatives, both in terms of where it is and what sort of uh, uh, SDG is being, uh, being addressed. And so we want a complementation of the private sector initiative and, uh, and of course the uh, government, uh, government sector. So, so these are our, uh, our next steps actually. So as we said, yeah, COVID-19 is uh, very unprecedented and the uh, consequences are far reaching. And we have a lot of lessons learned, uh, but uh, we know that uh, there have been a lot of, uh, of scaring. And so uh, one of the first things we need to do is really to conduct that needs assessment. Uh, we have asked actually many member agencies to do it already. So we're doing futures thinking also at the same time that we are doing this, uh, the, the PDP, the current PDP. The innovation agenda is also one of the uh, uh, legislations that were passed pre-COVID, just before COVID. And uh, we're uh, coming up with the uh, national innovation agenda strategy document that is actually also, um, you know, a major centerpiece will also be on digitalization. So many things are uh, happening, but we're just so happy that uh, um, the uh, SDR 2022 uh, seem to align very well with the uh, with, with the plans that are that have been laid out for for the Philippines uh, in terms of the uh, SDG action. And uh, I, I look forward to working with this uh, with this network both the Philippines and, of course, the, uh, the global network going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek Adelion, for uh, your presentation. Thank you for sharing your response. So based from her presentation, we had a glimpse on the government's implementation of the SDGs, which revolve around the six transformations discussed earlier. This includes actions to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And, um, well, from SDS and Philippines, uh, Yusek, of course, I would like to say also that we're, uh, we are pleased to work uh, hand in hand with NEDA in advancing the sustainable solutions in, in the country. Okay. Now, the floor is open for questions. Anyone who would like to ask your questions are invited to uh, well, raise their hand and unmute, unmute themselves or type their questions in the chat. Well, you're okay. So we have here, uh, I'd like to call on uh, CJ Hernandez. Hi, uh, CJ Hernandez here. Um, uh, one of, uh, uh, I have attended here as a uh, uh, as consultant um, for uh, UNDP um, and we're working on biodiversity financing. Um, and I, I think Guillaume uh, touched a, a point uh, regarding um, uh, using um, sustainability bonds um, in financing SDGs, and I was wondering, um, uh, where are we um, in, in the Philippines in terms of um, providing guidelines for these green bonds? So far as what we've heard, um, we are adopting, at least on the BSP side, ad adopting the um, ASEAN taxonomy for sustainable uh, finance securities, but uh, will there be any kind of um, the risking or support coming from uh, the banks or the government for um, for banks or companies who want to issue these kinds of bonds, specifically beyond green energy and, and biodiversity. That's that's, that's I, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I quickly respond? Go ahead. Yeah. So the uh, actually the previous administration has uh, has come up with a sustainability finance framework. Uh, what needs to happen next is for the uh, for the current administration to uh, uh, affirm actually it's uh, uh, or 
you know, basically uh, buy into that uh, framework and then we'll take it from there. So that one also has uh, already an action plan uh, complete with timeline. And uh, so uh, I don't want to uh, preempt the, the, the process, but uh, basically it's really about uh, making sure that uh, the, the current administration is uh, uh, um, accepts that uh, sustainability finance framework. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, uh, Eugene, for the question. Guillaume, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to 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 add um, a few thoughts. So, not from a Philippines perspective, obviously, but you know, in terms of what we see globally around, basically, one of the tools, right? One 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 tool that can be used for sustainable development. One of those innovative fi financing instruments. So, the, the first point is that the global market for sustainability themed bonds. So, here I'm talking about green, social, blue, SDG. Um, sustainability linked, and we've seen the few first issuance of a sovereign sustainability, a sustainability linked bond in, in Chile not long ago. It's pretty much at the, on the sovereign side, it's doubling um, every year. So there's a very rapid growth of those, of those instruments, and I think it picked up a lot also during and after COVID because it was perceived as a way to increase the borrowing capacity, especially for some countries that had relatively, you know, uh, lower average credit ratings, because as I mentioned, some countries managed to get green yields, basically to, to, to borrow at lower rates than what they usually borrow for and to achieve relatively long term long maturity. So on the sovereign side is doing on the corporate side also huge, huge increases, uh, of course, and increasingly also, I mean, those municipalities and cities that can borrow, we see also a growth in the use of those kinds of uh, sustainable development uh, financing instruments. There is obviously a great potential uh, for those for those tools. Um, again, greeniums, maturity, capacity to also, um, uh, you know, um, um, borrow relatively large uh, amounts. Um, the euro bond by Benin uh, managed to mobilize around 500 million um, uh, euros, uh, essentially, which for, for the government was significant. And we're seeing also um, several insurances being done um, in a number of, of, of countries. So there is, there is potential. Um, there's also a number of questions um, around those tools. And I, you know, I don't have the answers here, but I just want to put it um, out there that there is a question around, um, let's say, the, 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 the robustness of um, some of those frameworks, right? And I think we don't yet have sort of a clear, um, let's say, comparative understanding when it comes to, let's say, uh, the exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria, the governance um, systems that are sort of around those bonds and so on. Um, and I think that will be important for the community to document this to, uh, to avoid any accusation of green uh, washing as we, we have seen for other uh, types of instruments. The second point is um, more around the world, the, 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 the work that, or the involvement of, let's say, um, civil society in shaping those bonds, but also monitoring um, the impacts obtained by those uh, by those bonds, right? So when you do those bonds, the idea is that you set uh, targets for sustainable development and so on. Could we imagine a role also for scientists and experts also to, to be part of those conversations when you shade, uh, shape up those, those, those bonds, in addition to obviously the governments and uh, the, the financing institutions? And the same for the mon on the monitoring side, right? So Again, in some of the discussions that we've been involved in, it's been used as an additional criteria of um, you know, how serious the bond framework is, the fact that an independent institution like SDSN will be doing year on year the monitoring for the impact that's being generated, basically, and that's in the case of the, the African country uh, in it. And then the last question, which, which I think is also a very important one, is how replicable uh, are those types of instruments across uh, country contexts and um, settings. We're working, I mentioned, uh, with a lot of small island developing states, uh, for instance, that to a large extent are facing also similar challenges of Philippines when it comes to uh, you know, management of biodiversity, coastal areas, uh, resilience to climate events, and, and so on. Um, and so there is a question here around how do you develop those kind of blue bonds in those very small um, island states. Could there, could we imagine a role also for the IMF, especially in terms of the special drawing rights, the, the, the SDRs to provide some of the securities around this. So 
I'm putting it out there that I think there's a lot of potential with those tools. Again, it allowed some countries to borrow at lower rates with a large maturity, but there are some questions around the robustness, um, the monitoring, um, but also around the replicability to all uh, country settings. Yeah, thanks, thanks, yeah. Gil. Um, that's actually one of the, like one of uh, my, my follow-up follow question is that um, if, if there's kind of like any resources where we can see like success um, uh, stories in, in terms of um, issuing these funds, because like um, for example, yeah, specifically here in the Philippines, the problem with biodiversity financing is that measuring these takes a lot of time, which creates a lot of uncertainty risk in if you look at it on a financial standpoint. Um, and so um, I was hoping if um, there are any kind of like um, resources where we can look into how how uh, international uh, monetary associations like IMF, as you mentioned, ADB, World Bank can help the risk, the securities to make it a bit more, um, I guess, uh, less risky for, for investors to to, um, to buy in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to mention as well, Eman, that uh, actually for uh, for some of our uh, the, the private sector and even the the private banks that they have, they have actually issued already the sustainability bonds bonds um, back in 2016, 2017, again. And uh, in terms of a sovereign, uh, I think uh, early this year. Uh, was the first time that the the, the Philippine sovereign uh, uh, um, tapped into this uh, sustainability bonds. Um, I I still don't know if uh, if uh, we have those sorts of uh, um, um, uh, issuances for the the sub national, but I do know that uh, uh, that's part of the program also of the land bank and the uh, the DBP. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you also for the question, CJ. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I would uh, call on the two people who have their hands raised and will consolidate the questions via chat. Okay. Um, I'd like to call on Dr. Mary Rosellis from Atenea to ask her question. Yes, thank you. This is really for Undersecretary De Leon, whose presentation I much appreciated. And that is, Secretary uh, Yusef, where does the in where does the informal economy fit in here? since we know that about 70 percent of uh you know the economy is made up of the informal and even though you have now recognized the msmes as very significant nonetheless in addition to that one they are now registered but still live in informal settlements and so are considered illegal and their spaces for their own economic ventures are not accepted they're illegal then there's the self-employed, very small scale, you know, uh, Tindera here and there, who doesn't fit in at all. And I think those of us who are in anthropology, sociology recognize that this is a mechanism of survival and improvement a, a little by little as they go up. So where in the SDG system does the informal economy and those workers fit in? Most, of, a lot of whom are women also, you should say. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mom. Um, actually, uh, uh, I am more familiar, of course, with the PDP framework. And so let me just uh, uh, give an answer in relation to the PDP. So uh, in the PDP, uh, we do have a number of, uh, of programs that is uh, intended to, uh, well, first of all, develop the capabilities of individuals, families, and even um, uh, established livable and sustainable communities. And so part of that, uh, uh, part of that is also making sure that uh, in terms of the informal settlements, then uh, that, that will also be uh, uh, taken care of. There's also um, uh, programs in terms of um, uh, increasing opportunities for uh, you know, gaining all these micro credentials, uh, having this uh, this micro creden credentials, so that you you improve their employability, and of course uh, a more active um, employment facilitation uh, program as well. Of course, in addition to the social protection uh, program. So our social protection program, we want it to be um, uh, rationalized so that you have, you know, the, the whole, again, you have that comprehensive framework where you have a transformative part, you have the uh, the promotive part, you have the uh, preventive, and then you have the uh, the protective. 
And so um, we have actually, uh, we, we have done some, uh, some studies looking at uh, our social protection systems. And uh, those are things that, uh, that will input into the discussion of, uh, you know, how do we make, um, how do we improve our social protection systems. So uh, as you mentioned that uh, many of the informal sector workers remain, uh, um, you know, do not enjoy the benefits, of course, and that will be part of the uh, the social protection system. So it's not just about assistance. It's also about making sure that, uh, you know, their other rights are actually also uh, protected. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Yusek, and thank you, uh, Dr. Mary, for the question. Yeah, I'm happy to, go to ahead. Add on top of this, just to very, very, very quickly. So, um, great question, Mary, of course. Um, informality is covered in the SDGs. So, if you look at SDG 8 and SDG uh, 10, you will see um, that target 8.3 um, and target 10.2 also um, cover at least partly some of the issues around um, informality, access to decent uh, job and also um, inclusion uh, irrespective of you know many different um, population characteristics so um, it is covered in the SDGs um, what we track in the sustainable development report is more um, things that are related to obviously it's been mentioned by Rosemary um, the social protection um, issues universal health coverage we also have indicators around decent uh, working um, conditions um, so this is at least partly covered in our uh, annual assessments of, of SDG performance we haven't done I would I would say at, at SDSN a, a let's say a flagship study on informality and SDG uh, uh, achievement but I think there's a number of, of good UN reports that have been released um, relatively uh, you know, a, a few a few months ago, including uh, one by the, the UN UN DESA around the link between informality and SDG. So there's a number of re resources out there that have made um, those, those linkages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, now I'd like to call on Dr. Erin Ordonez from Alliance Agricultura for his question. Sir, uh, you're on mute. Oh. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I also represent the Federation of Philippine Industries as well as Agriculture. Uh, this question is uh, for uh, Undersecretary Rosemary Anivang, whom I respect greatly. I, I know about good work. You know, goals are set so that we can guide action. Water is very important to sustainable development, and it can be found in at least three goals. Goal six, clean water. Goal nine, infrastructure for water. And goal 12, climate action. Here's the question I have. Um, I, I congratulate NEDA because water is a big problem has been ignored here. And if you look at our record, it's terrible in terms of uh, how we deal with water. Now, NEDA, I want to congratulate Undersecretary Dion because they completed a water supply roadmap. Okay. But in 2018, they said the 34 agencies don't talk to each other. In 2018, NEDA did something strategic. They said the most important thing is to have a group that would coordinate these 34 agencies. They wrote an executive order, right, which has not been signed. I congratulate them because President Marcos, after all these years, said it would be a priority bill. But you know how priority bills are. Sometimes they take six years to happen. And the last years have been total disaster. Now, that executive order, they put that aside, okay, because they said the bill will be passed. It was not passed. Today's priority bill, it may not still be passed. So I'd like to ask Secretary Leon, while we can talk about the theoretical implications of goals, the goals are important in that they motivate action. Water is important in sustainable development. Now, here we go again with the promise of a bill. In the meantime, there's an outstanding executive order which would at least coordinate these agencies. And it was not signed because of the promise of a bill. I'd like to ask Undersecretary Leon, can you have this signed now because that bill may never pass? And in the meantime, we've suffered. La Nanina is coming. We're all messed up. Just for you to know, our water forage harvesting is 4% compared to the 60%. They said, with La Nina, water everywhere, drought, water nowhere, because you don't collect the, the water, correct? So I'm just Leon, I'm now talking about action, guided by the goal, there, the goals here, SDG. But can you do something so that except for which is not signed by the previous administration, will now be signed because at least this president understands it because he made it the priority bill, but still Congress may not pass it. So under Secretary Leon, can you guide me on that? Can you, can you tell me if you can work on this and push for it because I've been in water for a while and I know that Ned has done excellent work. 
But again, the work will not happen unless uh, they put budget and action behind it. Under Secretary De Leon. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ordonez. And uh, and yes, you uh, you you rightly as you rightly pointed out, uh, we have. Uh, Managed to convince the uh, president as well on the uh, importance, actually, of this uh, of this uh, piece of legislation. And you're you're right that we will um, we will give it another push. Uh, actually, this is the same uh, uh, thing we have with the uh, with the National Land Use Act. We already have a draft EO and also the bill. Uh, but of course, both of them uh, did not see the light of day. But uh, with respect to this one. Uh, we're hoping that um, uh, we we actually have done uh, um, studies already on, on on this one. We have already done the consultations, and uh, yes, we will be presenting this again to the to the president, to the cabinet, uh, and uh, and try to give it another push uh, in in the legislation. Uh, but uh, we will be yes, we will be uh, approaching it on on two fronts. Um, I've just been to uh, uh, Region 8 actually two weeks back, and I was really, um, it, it's really uh, painful to see, uh, you know, poor, uh, poor families uh, spending what would amount to about a third of their, uh, of their budget just to have uh, potable water. And, uh, and this was actually in an area where I'm sure there's a spring <laughs> somewhere, and uh, you know uh, it's uh, it's really just uh, about having um, really that agency to be able to to, to coordinate all this uh, all these efforts, uh, have it as a priority. Uh, but yes, that is something that uh, we will do, and uh, in fact. Uh, our uh, newly appointed uh, undersecretary for uh, investment programming, I, I don't know if you know him, it's uh, Dokoy Capuno. Actually, his, uh, one of his uh, major studies is uh, linking uh, malnutrition of children with the lack of uh, good water supply. And so uh, he, he knows very well the importance of, uh, of uh, having a good uh, water supply system. And then uh, we have already... Um, um, uh uh informed him about uh you know this governance issue with respect to uh water so um yeah so just that. yeah just a sound bite, just sound right i want i like you that you're lobbying the congress i want you to lobby the executive because an executive order sure. can congress takes forever and the second and last point is in the whole world we have the integrated water resource management system and they do basins and our basins get 2 million pesos per basin. But they told me the outstanding woman of the Philippines in, in, uh, in the region said that she gets 2 million. If only, she only got 10 million, then she can mobilize the hundreds of millions of all the agencies. But with 2 million, she cannot do it. So can you please lobby, see the legislation takes longer. I would like you to lobby the executive on the executive meeting. I'd like you to lobby the budget, okay? Because mm -hmm. budget should follow NEDA. And give this, these councils, water basin councils, which are not limited by political boundaries, the money to do their work. And it's really ridiculous because whoever does it and we don't. So thank you because for me, I like to legislative lobbying, but for, for me that takes forever. And I think you guys are the smartest in the country who are planning. Just lobby the executive, they're easier to convince, I think. Thank you. We'll do our best, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ordonez, for the question. Uh, we're going over time by uh, just a few minutes, but maybe to draw the discussion to a close, we have several questions regarding participation of non-government organizations, civil society, industry, etc. So maybe uh, just to draw the discussion to a close for both uh, Mr. Lampatun and for you, Adelion, Um, any words on the role of the different sectors? Uh, for sustainability, given that this plenary for one is composed of, you know, a very diverse uh, individuals. We have people who are, uh, we actually have country managers from different networks abroad. Uh, we also have specialists uh, in the Philippines. We have students also in the Philippines. So it's a very diverse group. So maybe just some notes on the role of collaboration um, and the role of different sectors in achieving the 2030 agenda. Anyone who'd like to go first? Yeah, if I if I can go first. So just to mention, uh, I, I already mentioned actually about the stakeholders chambers. Uh, right now we do have it at the at the national uh, level, uh, and uh, what we plan to do is to um, to to constitute also the stakeholders chambers because uh, it seems that there's a lot of demand for it uh, to to have this uh, at the regional levels as well. Because for the national level, 
we actually uh, uh, made it a point that we bring in the you know those NGOs, the civil society that have uh, nationwide outreach, uh, nationwide reach. Uh, but uh, we we know that there are many important uh, uh, players also in the uh, in the regions, and so that is uh, that is actually something that uh, they can um, they can uh, seriously consider. And that is uh, pertaining to the to the SDGs. So, like I said, we want complementation of efforts so that uh, so that we can have uh, you know really that no one left behind. So, in terms of uh, uh, the sort of uh, SDG being targeted, and also in terms of uh, the geographical area and the sectoral uh, um, uh, again the sectors that are that are being covered. And of course, for the PDP, we are doing consultations. Uh, like I said, to to uh, to start this uh, this uh, Friday, we will also do um, online consultations, uh, virtual consultations. And uh, again, we uh, we hope that you can all uh, join us and uh, you know uh, give us your inputs, uh, so we can uh, we can formulate this uh, transformational PDP. Thank you. Yeah, maybe just maybe to, to add on top of this, I mean, I've, I've mentioned quite a bit the role of obviously scientific uh, networks and experts. So maybe in my answer here, because that's a big topic around, you know, the question of um, consultation, public participation, but just to to cover maybe this, this issue around, you know, citizen assemblies, public participation and so on. I think this is obviously very important for the, the, the effective implementation of this agenda. I think we've seen since 2015 a number of good examples um, globally, I think. You know, Finland, for instance, has put in place um, citizens' assemblies to inform its SDG strategies, budget, even the indicator system, and so on. I was quite impressed. Was Marie in your presentation about uh, also what the Philippines has been uh, doing in this area and is planning to do also around the, the development uh, plans? Um, so I think it's very important, not only at the national level, but I think it, it makes also a lot of sense when it comes to implementing at the subnational level as well, because this is where a lot of the <clears throat> the trade-offs, the distributional uh, impacts need to be very much uh, thought through. And I think here, you know, co collecting the views of, from a number of, of, of participants and stakeholders is particularly uh, important. What we've seen also is that, you know, some of those processes are kind of permanent. Quite often also, it's uh, it can be also one-offs, um, consultations organized only around the voluntary national review uh, process. Um, and as we've seen, you know, the Philippines has done three VNRs, for instance, but many countries have only done one, for instance, which means that, you know, it doesn't um, give a lot of uh, opportunities, actually, if you just do it once around uh, the VNR since 2015 to actually collect the views and opinions on how to implement this, this agenda from, uh, from people. And then there's another question, and maybe here I'm a bit biased because I'm sitting here in, in France, but there's a question also around what happens, you know, after those consultations, right? How are the insights um, and information collected being used. Um, there's been a bit of disappointment in France around some of those public consultation, if, especially for implementing the Paris um, Climate Agreement, um, which can lead also to a backlash uh, in terms of trust uh, in those uh, processes. Um, so I think, you know, not only the process for consultation, but also, you know, how um, the inputs are being used and making sure that it's communicated effectively afterwards, you know, what has been the impact of those consultations and shaping the, the policies is, uh, is, is, is crucial um, as well. Thank you. Okay, at this uh, juncture, we would like to present the certificate of appreciation to our speakers. The citation reads, Sustainable Development Solutions Network Philippines, housed at the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability, Ateneo de Manila University, presents the Certificate of Appreciation to for sharing his her time uh, and expertise as plenary speaker and discussant during the SDSN Philippines General Assembly public plenary entitled Crossroads to 2030. Given the seventh day of September, 2022, signed Philip uh, Arnold Tony PhD, Country Manager, SDSN Philippines, and Dr. Kendra Gotanko Gonzalez, Leadership Council Chair of SDSN Philippines. We would like to... Uh, Award the certificate to Mr. Guillaume Lafotun. Thank you, Guillaume, for, for joining us this morning. And to Yusek Rosemary Adilion for, uh, for sharing, for reacting to the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, we would like to, um, next slide, please invite you to our upcoming events. Okay. And I will share some links in the slide, ne uh, in the chat. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, another network, ASEAN University Network, 
will have its conference next week. It's essentially on promoting, uh, coming up with ways to promote and mainstream ecological education. So if you're interested, it's on Wednesday and Tuesday next week. Registration will be open until Friday. The link is on the chat. Uh, next slide. So if we, uh, we have students in the plenary, so if you're interested also to join this global initiative called Turn, around, Turn It Around Cards, and you see the cards on the screen turning around, um, this is a way to promote uh, having a more sustainable world using artwork and writing. They're, they will host a workshop during the conference, so please do join us if you're interested. And then the next event, is the 10th annual international conference on sustainable development, which will happen virtually. It will be on September 19 to 20. So please uh, check the website. You can see the link on the screen and on the chat if you're interested. Join. And lastly, <laughs> on SBSN Philippines will and AAS together with uh with Xavier University and Ateneo de Dava will host a food systems webinar on September 28, focusing on the role of the academe in promoting sustainable food systems and the future. You can see the sign up link also in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Next. Okay. Uh, we will have our group photo, but before that, just to draw the the session, I would uh, we call on Mr. Afik to deliver the closing remarks. Hi everyone. Um, can you hear me good? Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Aman. Thank you for your kind introduction um, and the opportunity to speak at this uh, General Assembly of SDSN Philippines. Good day to Undersecretary Rosemary, uh, Guillaume Lafortune, Dr. Kendra, uh, Dr. Randy, and also to yourself, Dr. Aman. Um, I will be very brief. Uh, my name is Afik Smaizam, the Secretary at Focal Point for SDSN Philippines. Uh, apart from SDSN Philippines, I manage uh, six other networks across Asia. I've been working closely with uh, Dr. Iman in the past few months uh, in steering the network on a positive uh, trajectory. Uh, we at SDSN are extraordinary global network of universities and knowledge institutions covering most of the world. We now are at 1,700 plus um, SDSN member institutions uh, from 143 countries, um, making SDSN by far the largest such organization in the world. Um, the SDSN has been successfully uh, in promoting collaboration across countries, enabling universities to share their knowledge and learn from each other's experiences. So I just want to emphasize that um, as this in Philippines should take advantage of this access to uh, resources, knowledge, and also connections to the rest of the world. Um, I had joined the morning session of the General Assembly and took note of some of the updates um, such as impact reporting, um, SDG specialization database, and et cetera. So Dr. Eman and I will definitely try to operationalize these comments all for the betterment um, of the network. Um, I would also like to welcome the newest member in Philippines, uh, Batanga State University. So we now have a total of 20, 23 uh, members. Uh, we, while we are in the spirit of network expansion, um, we should also focus on growing on internal organic growth, uh, internal engagements. Um, as I oversee applications of interested members of SDSN, um, I would also like to happily announce that the Father Saturi Nino Urius University, uh, FSUU, has submitted a, an application. Uh, and and well, with that being said, I would like to kindly invite all the universities in the Philippines in attendance to check out SDSN and to join the Philippines network. For further details, you can reach out to Dr. Edmund. Uh, before I end, uh, I would just like to leave you with two comments. So firstly, in 2020, SDSN Philippines had carried out a solutions forum. Uh, we could maybe perhaps plan uh, something similar for next year. Um, uh, so, so SDSN Philippines could carry out another solutions forum next year to demonstrate to the new Philippines um, administration um, on what Philippines has in store uh, when it comes to 
sourcing local solutions. Um, SDSM Malaysia uh, had carried it, this out uh, a few months ago. Uh, secondly, uh, we should focus on impact or focus on creating impact-driven uh, initiatives. So it is good and timely that Under, Under Secretary um, Rosemary is here because we, we would want to maintain close proximity uh, with the Philippine government, particularly with uh, policymakers that deal directly with the SDGs. So any events or initiatives uh, should at least, quote unquote, uh, move a needle um, in the country. So with that, I would like to end by saying, um, let's move onward and upward for SDSN Philippines for the benefit of Philippines. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Emma. Thank you. Okay. Now uh, we would like to invite everyone to, uh, to turn on their camera if possible for a group photo. We will also, uh, after we have the group photo, we will uh, flash the, the link for the evaluation form. We hope you can accomplish it. But for now, we'll have a photo, a uh, picture, a uh, souvenir photo taken. Okay. It's a big Zoom room and we have the several uh, screens. Okay. So just keep smiling, everyone. Okay. Next one, I hope we're ready. Let's do this. Okay. First frame. Okay. Next. Keep smiling. Next. Okay, mga humahabol. Okay. Next frame. Okay. Almost there. Okay, eight frame. And last and four. Okay, thank you very much for attending. Bixen, if you can please uh, flash the QR code for the evaluation form. I'll send it also to the chat. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I hope uh, you enjoyed our discussion and learned a lot for, from today's discussion. Uh, we hope to see you in our future uh, events of uh, future events of SBSN Philippines and AAS. Thank you once again. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, everyone.
So I'm putting the others in the waiting room. Yes, konti na lang. 